Good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to all that join us online. Um, of course, still joining in, but uh, let's start. Let's try to be as much as possible on time. My name is Angel Moraes. I'm the director of the Institute on Religion, Law, and Lawyers' Work here at Corbin Law School. And uh, as part of our mission to promote spaces for dialogue, for constructive dialogues around issues that, um, that are critical in society, and we start to talk about this conference a while back, actually, in 2020, we were, think we were planning to have the conference in the fall, and obviously the pandemic didn't allow us to do so, and we postponed for another year, and here we are in 2022. And unfortunately, with a heavy heart, actually, I have to say that migration is still uh, a very important topic today in 2022 for us to discuss and open this space for conversation. Um, and um, I'm glad that uh, we will try so very quickly um, today to address in the morning uh, Bahamic hospitality from the three traditions and then go on for how people try, they're still trying to create spaces for concretely answers to the challenges of migration and then close up the day with an uh, overview of the U.S. Uh, legal landscape with uh, Judge Mimi Tanskov. But I'm excited. Uh, I have a lot to learn today. And um, with these exchanges, I'm grateful to be here in person. I'm grateful for everyone that is joining us online. And on another note, uh, I also want to take advantage of this moment at the very beginning. I want to thank uh, our colleagues that we put for two years now putting this conference together. Um, uh, Rachel Stern from the Fritz Society, Ashley Society, and Ori Sols from Georgetown, who really put this, these panels together, this day together. But also a shout out to the Institute's Assistant Director, Cristiano Teirinho, who really put a lot of the work on, the, on behind the scenes. And so really thank you. And hosting a hybrid event is still a new thing for us. We are still trying to figure it out, so bear with us. If something uh, doesn't go well, and for those online, please send us your questions using the Q&A feature. Uh, and also, if you have any other troubles, just shoot an, an email to loveregion.forum.edu or use the Q&A feature as well. So, um, and finally, uh, I also want to thank our colleagues from the Jewish Studies, for them Jewish Studies, also the Office of Mission and Integration, who help us spread the word. And finally, our co sponsor, the Fritz Asher Society. And without further ado, I pass the word also to Rachel, who will welcome you all. Thank you. Good morning. As Andy already said, for two years we kept rescheduling this conference, and I'm thrilled that we are gathering here today in person as well as, as, well as virtually. During these past two years, the questions we are posing with this conference have not lost their relevance. Quite the contrary. Even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we were in the midst of a global refugee crisis with an official count of one, 103 million forcibly displaced persons as of this summer. Second to today were the numbers of people migrating during the first half of the 20th century with the rise of Nazism and other fascist movements across most of Europe. The Fritzascher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art researches, discusses, publishes, and exhibits artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. We commemorate their lives and achievements and research the context in which they lived and worked. With our programs and projects like our online exhibition, Identity, Art and Migration, we aim to enrich the understanding of the history of the 20th century and discuss relevant topics in the context of that history in an environment that surpasses ethnic, cultural and religious differences. In that spirit, I very much look forward to today's discussion. It is now my honor to introduce the co-founder of the Fritz Asher Society and today's moderator, Ori, uh, Ori Shortis, 
who teaches at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., across a range of disciplines from art history and theology to philosophy and political history. He is the former director of the Bene Brit Kluznik National Jewish Museum and has curated more than 90 exhibitions across the country and overseas. He has authored or edited more than 25 books and several hundred articles and essays. Recent volumes include Our Sacred Science, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, The Ashen Rainbow, Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust, and Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture, as well as Growing Up Jewish in India, Synagogues, Ceremonies, and Customs from the Bnei Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. But before I give over to him, I think Andy Morales and Christina Oturinho uh, and Elana Yashemsky, sorry for um, stumbling over your names, <laughs> from Fordham University's Institute on Religion, Law, and Lawyers' Work, for your continued belief in the importance of this conference, for enriching. Um, yes. Okay. for enriching the discussion by bringing some of today's distinguished speakers on board and for co-organizing the event. I thank Fordham University Center for Jewish Studies for collaborating, and I thank Kathy Horton for suggesting this very fruitful collaboration, which hopefully is the first of many. And last but not least, I thank the Alliance of America Corporation for generously sponsoring this event. Without further ado, or shall this? Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Eddie. Um, you might notice, as you're sensitive to such things, because you have good ears, that of the three of us, I'm the only one who was born in this country, which speaks volumes because what Rachel has done, what Eddie has done, not just with respect to this conference, but with their lives and as contributors to this city and this country says a lot about how important it is to welcome those who weren't born in it. And that's an idea that really applies across um, countries, but one that we should be particularly concerned with in our own country. Before introducing and introducing and introducing, may I also call to your attention the schedule, because I know you don't have it in front of you, so you have some idea where we're going. There will be three morning talks. Uh, I will introduce the speakers in a few moments. And all things being equal, we will finish those talks by about 11.30. And there will be about a half hour for Q&A at that point, after which there'll be about an hour for lunch. And the, uh, the second af the afternoon panel, again, a handful of speakers will begin around 1, 105, and it will continue till about two, and then there'll again be a Q&A, and then a coffee break, and then um, in the afternoon, we will hear from the congressman himself. And uh, we should wrap everything up on the order of four o'clock, just so you all know. And anyone who tries to leave early, we, we do have guards at the door who won't allow you to do so. So don't try to, because we've got you, we've got you. Of course, the issue of migration of immigrants, of refugees, of taking in those whom one takes in, whom one doesn't necessarily know because they're strangers, famously within the Abrahamic traditions begins with Abraham. And I remind you that Abraham in the Hebrew Bible is called a Hebrew. And that that word refers to the fact that he goes from place to place. He's a keeper of flocks. He doesn't own a stitch of land. In fact, he doesn't own any land until Genesis 23, when he wants to buy the cave of Machpelah as a burial place for his wife, Sarah. And the owner, a fellow who is referred to as Ephron, the Hittite says, well, you know, I'd really like you to buy the whole piece of property, not just the cave. And without even any negotiating, because after all, Abraham is in mourning at that point, he says, sure, whatever it is, what's the price, I'll pay it. And it's done. But the point is, it's the first field piece of real estate that he owns. And we find him earlier, if he's famous in a way for being a wanderer, we find him earlier when he is himself 
settled in an area temporarily because he doesn't own it, already welcoming famously in Genesis 18, a trio of strangers. And the funny thing is, that trio of strangers offers him some important information, one, of, one piece of which pertains to the nearby towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where his nephew Lot has settled. And in Genesis 19, we have this even more spectacular because it's even more complex view of Lot going out to bring in a pair of strangers whom he invites to spend the night in his house. And in the 19th verse of the 19th chapter, and Zeki, I know you appreciate the importance of 19 in Islam, so here you go, chapter 19, verse 19. Um, the inhabitants, the Sodomites, when Lot will not give up the strangers whom they want to bring out because they want to do with them what they want to do with them, what they do with strangers, which is not good stuff, and Lot says, no, 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 they're, they're, they're under my roof. They comment about Lot. How dare this little Schmendrick say that to us? But the more precise articulation is of him that he came here as a ger, as a stranger, or to be more specifically, Balagur is the phrase. He came to dwell here. He's not a citizen, yet he dares to offer judgment to us. Um, and of course, the outcome of that story, as you know, is not a happy one in the end for the Sodomites. And I'll come back to that story later on this morning. The thing about Abraham, though, it's not just that we see him as a, as a host. We also see him as someone who is constantly being tested by God. We see two particular places of interest. One is back in chapter 18, when um, he learns about from the mouths of the strangers, or rather from God through those strangers, of the plan to get rid of the Sodomites because there's such no goodness. And Abraham's moral quotient is being tested because obviously his reaction should have been sure. Where can I sit and watch? But instead he says, well, wait a second. What if there are 50 righteous men? Shouldn't you save the city for their sake? And he argues God down from 50 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10, at the end of which God says, okay, if there are 10 righteous men in Sodom for their sake, I won't destroy these cities. Of course, they can't be found. But the point is, Abraham is being, think about this, does God really need moral lessons from Abraham? It's Abraham who's being tested and passes with blind colors. Well, of course, that turns out to be uh, almost a foil for the more severe test that's going to come about in Genesis 22, where Abraham is instructed to bring his son and offer him as a sacrifice up on Mount Moriah or wherever it is. And Abraham, of course, without even questioning at this point. He who did all the questioning about Sodom and Gomorrah, this is his son Isaac. And in Genesis, Ishmael's already gone. So that's the only son he's got left. He doesn't even, he got up the next morning and off they went. So it's an extraordinary symptom of almost superhuman faith. But here's the thing about Abraham. He's not superhuman. He's all too human. Because guess what? He never saw Sarah again alive. At the end of Genesis 2, he went off to Beersheba. At the beginning of Genesis 23, he came up to Hebron to mourn for Sarah and then to purchase the cave of Machpelah as a place to bury her. He never had the guts to go back and face his wife with what he had almost done. So he is an everyday guy, even as he, even as he is this superhuman man of faith. And I think one of the important features or one of the important ideas about that is that when he does something like welcoming those three strangers that we get back in Genesis 18, we shouldn't say, oh, well, of course, Abraham's Mr. Super Superguy. So, of course, he does that because we want to be reminded that he's also just like you and me. So we can and should aspire to be like him in our welcoming of strangers, just as ordinary people might be, could be, should be. The strangers he gives food to, the strangers he gives drink to, the strangers tell him about the birth that is forthcoming, forthcoming of Isaac. They also tell him about the forthcoming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, as I earlier said. And there are three of them. And what's interesting, of course, is that all of this is part of what we call a revelation. Traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims all understand that this is part of a text 
which came from God through Moses to us. And as with every revelation everywhere, it ends up requiring interpretation. Because once Mo is gone, I can't say, hey, what, 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 what did God mean when God said not to commit murder? Can I swat a mosquito? Is that an act of murder? Or is it okay to do that? Why does not seeing a kid in its mother's milk mean that I can't have a cheeseburger? It's based on interpretation. And interestingly, I'd like to think interpretationally of a possibility for those three strangers. You might say they represent Judaism, Christianity, Islam, three Abrahamic traditions that begin with the same sort of revelation. And of course, if we look at the chapters that follow thereafter, for Jews, Isaac about Moriah is a symbol of continuity from generation to generation. He becomes part of this very personal covenant that Abraham had had because Abraham didn't question God. And when Isaac says, hey, Pop, where's the, I see you've got everything except where's the sacrifice or where's the animal? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. Surely by the time his father has bound him up and the word Akedah is binding, has bound him up, laid him on the altar, his tushy is getting warm from the, from the wood that's been kindled, and his dad stands over him with that big knife that he stole from Sarah's kitchen that morning. That's not on the text, by the way. That's the moment for him to say, hey, Pop, are you sure you know what you're doing? He does not. So his faith at that moment is as seamless as Abraham's had been. And he becomes, therefore, in his own sense, in his own way, party to this covenant, as opposed to simply inheriting it from his father. It's not accidental that on the Jewish calendar, we stop the ordinary order of reading from the Torah that begins a few weeks after the Jewish New Year, so that by the time we get to the New Year, we're deep into Deuteronomy. We pit stop, we take a half stop back, and we read Genesis 22, because it's all about continuity. For Christianity, Isaac anticipates Jesus the offering by the father of the son who is redeemed at the last moment anticipates the offering by the father of the son who redeems humankind by his own self-sacrifice. For Islam, the ambiguity within the Quran as to which son it is leads to a long discussion where for the most part, it's Ishmael who is understood to be that son altogether. So we have three different takes on the same general story and the thing is, if we come back to the version of that story that we get in Genesis, we find Isaac and Ishmael coming together when? In Genesis 25, to bury Abraham, their father, and the emphasis is on together. Judaism, Christianity, Islam have as a starting point these texts, these narratives, these stories, and the traditions carry us from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament to the Quran and to the various interpretive literatures, all of which concur on one issue for sure, and that is the importance of welcoming the stranger. So they all look back to Abraham in his welcoming of those three strangers as signifying that very important issue. If we fast forward through history from the biblical to the post biblical to the Quranic and the post Quranic era, and through a range of interpretive literatures and a range of experiences and a range of ideas. And we come to the 20th century. One of the great paradoxes of that century is that it comes on the heels in the West in particular of a long stretch of about 130, 140 years of supposition that because of the industrial and technological and scientific and with them political and with them philosophical and theological revolutions that have taken place, that on our own, we can figure it all out for ourselves. And it comes as quite a shock that we hit World War I called the Great War and find that all of the skills that we've developed in the previous century and a half have led in one horrific direction the destruction of many, many, many more millions of individuals in one fell swoop than we had been capable of destroying in previous generations. And we follow a hop, skip, and a jump, and we get to the Holocaust a mere generation later, and it is both part of and separate from World War II. 
If World War II offers destructiveness in war that dwarfs the destructiveness in war of World War I, which dwarfed the destructiveness in war of every previous generation, World War II also introduces technology from World War I, like gas, not to be used against soldiers, but to be used against civilians. And that's the outcome of a decision made in 1933 by the German government to turn citizens into strangers. The depossessing, the dispossessing of citizenship rights of a particular population. And over time, different populations are included in that formulation, makes it feasible to deprive them of the protective rights, much less the welcoming rights, that would assure them in a more broader sense of protection. Marginalizing a population is what leads so easily, all too easily, to genocide. And in spite of the oft used phrase, never again with reference to the Holocaust, alas, it turns out that aside from genocides that preceded the Holocaust, genocides from Bosnia to Cambodia to Rwanda have expanded our vocabulary of locations for this kind of anti welcoming the stranger uh, behavior to a great extent. Of course, conversely, it's precisely the hospitality, the caring, the welcoming of strangers on the part of individuals here or communities there that enabled otherwise victims to survive as other than victims. These are all things we'll hear about today. When we do come to the United States, which calls itself a nation of immigrants, because of course we are, as a country, there is no American citizen who has come from elsewhere who hasn't come from elsewhere. I mean, if we want to be technical about it, even Native Americans originally came here from elsewhere, but that was thousands and thousands of years ago. But certainly anyone who has become a citizen since, 19, since 1776 and thereabouts came from elsewhere. We're a nation of immigrants. And yet already by the 1830s and 40s, we had a group that called themselves with no sense of irony, nativists, who were anti-immigrant. That's the same time period in which some of those who were more indigenous, the Native Americans in Georgia, were forced marched in 1836 to Oklahoma and was known as the Trail of Tears. I point that out to point out that we have our own track record with which we have to deal, of which we need to be aware, which we cannot simply hide. And if we follow our own history into the 20th century, perhaps it's not accidental, that it's not far after the end of World War I, that an anti-immigration perspective running parallel to the Im immigration embracing perspective reaches a culmination with what's known as the Johnson Reed Act of 1924 that brings the idea of quotas to a fevered, narrowed, stringent kind of pitch. And we follow 100 years later, well, 98 to be precise. And we can certainly look at and ask about where we are, where we have been in the last several years. So that ultimately, this conference is about how we think about these things theologically, how we think about these things theoretically, and how we think about these things and act on how we think about these things actually on the ground. How do we engage our multiple pasts? How do we construct our present? And how do we ultimately shape our future and the future of our children and their children? That's really what this conference is about. So I'm happy to add a third welcome to you all from the first two that were provided by Rachel and Emmy, and uh, to say a few words about the first three speakers of the morning. Um, I have been tasked um, by default to uh, speak from the Jewish theological perspective about the issue of welcoming the stranger. And I will be followed by Father Thomas Massaro, SJ, who I see has managed to come from teaching class. You teach at some place called Fordham, I hear. In the Bronx. Somewhere in the Bronx. In my day, that was Fordham. 
Anyway, he is professor of moral theology at Fordham, uh, and uh, he's a Jesuit priest at the United States East Province. In that capacity, he's taught as professor of moral theology at Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Mass, at Boston College, and at um, a Jesuit School of <coughs> Theology, excuse me, of Santa Clara University in, Texas, in uh, California, sorry, where he also serves as dean. <coughs> Father Massaro holds a doctorate in Christian social ethics from Emory University. His nine books and over 100 published articles treat Catholic social teaching and its recommendations for public policies oriented to, to social justice, to peace, to worker rights, to poverty alleviation. He's also a former columnist for America Magazine, and he writes and lectures frequently on topics such as the ethics of globalization, peacemaking, environmental concern, the role of conscience in religious participation in public life, and developing the spirituality of justice. His most recent book is Mercy in Action, the Social Teachings of Pope Francis, and that came out in 2018. So I will be speaking first, Father Massaro will be speaking second, and our third speaker will be Zeki Zeratoprak, who comes to us from uh, John Carroll University uh, in Ohio, where he is the uh, Bidu Zaman Zaid Nursi Chair in Islamic Studies and a professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. He holds a PhD in Islamic Theology from the University of Marmara in Turkey, and his most recent books include Islam's Jesus, which was published by University Press of Florida in 2014, and also Islamic Spirituality, Theology, and Practice for the Modern World, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2017. And he's currently working on a book on Islamic eschatology. So talk about going to the future. That's the end point of the end point. And now I'm going to ask that this be removed because you're going to need this, correct? And I'll get it out of the way. And then I will begin. I'll say Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I come back to rebegin where I began my beginning, which is the reminder of Abra about Abraham that he is a Hebrew, and that the term means that he is someone who moves from place to place, from the Hebrew root of our ayin bet resh, which means someone who passes, uh, and that's important to understand because it means that the word itself does not inherently have either an ethnic nor a spiritual connotation. We eventually attach connotations to it because of whether who Abraham is, but it makes him an obvious candidate to be understood both as the beginning point for Judaism and as the beginning point for Christianity and as the beginning point for Islam. Uh, in fact, the term Islam, which you will probably hear later from Zeki, which means submission, means that Abraham, as a Muslim, small m, not large m, small m, meaning someone who submits to God's will, is an appropriate term from Arabic to refer to what he is, because he submits to God's will. And all of the different tests that he undergoes and what he does in response to God's commands reflect on him as a Muslim small m, as the ancestor of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. And when, in that moment where he first acquires property in Genesis 23, to buy the cave of Machpelah from Ephron the Hittite, in which Ephron says, please, I need you to buy the whole field and not just the cave. In presenting himself to Ephron, he says, I am a stranger and a dweller among you. So he acknowledges that he is not whatever we might call a citizen or a landowner or what have you. And the word stranger that's being translated as stranger is that word ger again. And the word that I just translated as well is toshav, someone who sits, someone who, who stays there. But it's understood that he can move and will move if he needs to from place to place. There is a wonderful moment in the life of his son Isaac where he discovers he has a green thumb. He discovers water and the locals chase him away and they keep chasing away each time he discovers water. 
So the area he ends up calling Be'er Sheva, the place of seven whales, because he keeps getting chased away because he has no rights to it. He is simply grazing his flocks on other lands. It's an important thing to understand about him because that will affect how he is and how his descendants are and how we think about him and them and ourselves. It's interesting that the word Ger will later be interpreted if it's juxtaposed with Toshav, a Ger Toshav, to have the implications of a kind of guess. So that's a positive impl implication because there are other terms that might be translated as stranger from Hebrew in the Bible, like the word Zar, which is a kind of neutral term. Ger has a more positive implication. And then, of course, there's also um, Nohar, for which the implication is someone who's dangerous, perhaps because that individual worships strange gods and therefore is likely to be obstructive to the spirituality of, of the Israelites. Be that as it may, Abraham the Hebrew, to repeat, in Genesis 18, welcomes these three strangers. They are simply called three men, at Mamre, Anashim, and the three figures offer, to whom he offers rather detailed hospitality as described in Genesis 18. He offers them fresh bread. He has Sarah making it right then on the spot. He offers them water. He offers to wash their feet as an act of hospitality. And of course, this beautifully dressed feel, which by the way, I don't, don't think it was kosher because it talks about it being uh, it's soaked in milk. Um, but Abraham hadn't read Exodus 23, 19 yet, so it's okay. He didn't understand yet. We hadn't gotten that far yet. In any case, the three give him the news about Isaac, that he will, that Abraham and Sarah at an advanced old age are going to have a son together. And as I earlier indicated, gives him also the impending news of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which leads us directly into Genesis 19 and again. Once again, the story of hospitality, if anything, even more extreme than Abraham's on the part of his nephew Lot, because he accepts these, well, in the beginning of the chapter, they're referred to as divine messengers, Malachim. But when the Sodomites want him to let them come out of the house so they can do with them what they want, they simply refer to them as men, Anashim. And mind you, Lot is standing outside the door. He won't let them pass. And he even offers. He says, take my two young daughters, but you cannot touch these strangers. They are under my roof. They are subject to my protection. They are subject to my hospitality. It's an extreme statement of his sense of obligation to protect them as such against an extreme threat from rather radically inhospitable people and so on. The biblical Abraham, of course, has a son Isaac. He has a son, Ishmael. The biblical narrative follows Isaac, who has a son, Jacob. And Jacob has a couple of interesting experiences with God himself, the second of which leads to his name being changed to Israel, Israel, one who has wrestled with God. And his heirs and descendants called Israelites go down into Egypt, where ultimately they are, are stuck as laborers for many, many generations. And that term Israelite, of course, has some of the connotations that that word Hebrew lacked. It comes to suggest a very distinct bloodline, descendants of Jacob's sons, but more importantly, a spiritual line, because it's those who end up agreeing to the covenantal principles that are set forth for the Israelites once they leave Egypt. And I point out to you that, a that uh, Moses' father-in-law, uh, Jethro, the Midianite, a Midianite priest, no less, seems to join them. He praised the God of Israel because he's so, so blown away by all the things that God did for the Israelites, which would underscore the feasibility of becoming an Israelite, not only ethnically, but more importantly, spiritually. Be that as it may, it is at Sinai that in Exodus 23, 9, among the things that are commanded to the Israelites is not to oppress the Gair. There's that word again, the stranger. And the condition of the reminder is don't forget, remember yourselves, for you were Gerim, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Interestingly, <clears throat> in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos in Greek means second law. And Deuteronomy often reiterates narrative details and commandment details that one finds throughout the first four books of the Torah. And sometimes there's a slight change 
in the specifics of the text as if to give a little bit of a clear explanation, keeping the seventh day as a Sabbath because if you want to be like, I, God, I rested on the seventh day, for example, more explicit in Deuteronomy than in Exodus. But in this passage, not oppressing the stranger, in Deuteronomy 10.19, it actually says love the stranger. Et hager. And that's extraordinary. If you think back to Lot, who's willing actually to offer his daughters in lieu of the strangers he's protecting, which strikes us as strange and extreme, well, think back to the commandment about parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. It doesn't say love them, because love can't be legislated. And yet here in Deuteronomy, the word love is used to legislate how strongly your feelings about the stranger should be because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, that same second phrase is used. Of course, the ideas of the Torah are expounded and expanded by the biblical prophets. So, for example, Jeremiah, twice in chapter 7, verse 6, and again in chapter 20, uh, 22, verse 3, suggests three different categories of inherently disenfranchised individuals who need to be protected. Jeremiah says, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow, you shall not oppress. But notice the order of words, the stranger comes first, even before orphan, even before widow. And indeed, the Judeans, the descendants of the Israelites, understood in the aftermath of Jeremiah's prophesying, when the temple was destroyed and they were taken into exile, that the reason for that was not because their weakened God got beaten up by the Babylonian gods, but they were coming to truly understand the absoluteness and universality of God, that God punished them for failing to live up to these covenantal prescriptions, just as they later understood a mere 48 years later, that when they turned back to God, God turned back to them, which is what made possible their return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. The Hebrew Bible will be filled out later on with other books beyond the Torah, beyond the prophets, such as the book of Job, which offers that unanswerable question of why the innocent suffer. Because Job is a righteous and pious man who is made grievously to suffer. And we know that he doesn't. We know that he's being tested. All he knows is that he's suffering and he can't understand why, since after all, He's such a pious and righteous man. And along the way in making his case to these three friends who presume to be his comforters, to his wife, who says, well, if you curse God, at least God would strike you dead, you'd be out of your suffering. In laying out how good he was, one of the things he says in chapter 31, verse 32 is, no care, no stranger had to spend the night in the street. My home was always open to the and we usually translate it as traveler. The Hebrew word is oreach. Oreach also means guest. So there was an explicit connection between he who was a stranger and he who becomes now a guest in your house. You should treat the stranger as your guest. All of this is part of what traditionally we think of as revelation. Every revelation in every tradition whether it's the Hebrew Bible, whether it's the Gospels, whether it's the Quran, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, whatever it is, because it's understood to come from a source other than a human source, and therefore is not necessarily easily intelligible. Like I said, does not commit any murder mean I can't kill a mosquito? Does not see the kid in its mother's milk mean that I can't have a cheeseburger? All of that revelation requires interpretation. And so within the Jewish tradition, of course, what we call Judaism is not the Bible, that's the foundation. But understanding what it means, which is a long and evolving and developing rabbinic tradition, using that word in the broadest sense, of interpretation is what becomes Judaism, built on Hebrew, Israelite, Judean foundation. So in Tractate Baba Metzia in the Talmud, for example, Tractate 59b, there is a further discussion and refinement of what one means by ger, distinguishing ger tzedek from ger toshav, someone who is a righteous stranger from someone who is just dwelling but not really playing by the rules that makes that individual capable of living amongst us. Rashi, the famous late 11th, early 12th century 
1040 to 1105, to be precise, so it was years. Commentator from northern France, he spent a little bit of time in Germany as well, in talking about that passage from Exodus that is repeated somewhat differently in Deuteronomy, talks about its intention as we all have our own faults. We must remember this when dealing with others. So he broadens the idea of treating the stranger to treating everybody with an awareness of our own limitations, lest we be offended by the limitations of others as if we have none. So it's not just about the stranger, it's about being more broadly welcoming to your fellow humans. And he takes Gare to mean an outsider of whatever sort. The 13th century Spanish rabbi, Nachmanides, famous for his Barcelona disputation, which led in the end to his own exile, from Barcelona to uh, Eretz Israel, where he spent the rest of his life. He comments regarding Exodus 23.9 that Ger means those who are powerless. It means those who are psychologically vulnerable out of being alone because they don't have any kind of a support community around them. There's a book called the Sefer Chinuch, the Book of Instruction, that is about contemporary with Nachmanides, also 13th century. In, and it notes that loving the Ger, looking specifically at the version of that commandment in Deuteronomy, means that one must have mercy on a man who is, and now I'm quoting from it, um, in a city not of his birth, one should not pass by him on the road. One should not pass by one who is helpless, who is without family, without friends, without protectors. And so it goes on. Again, universalizing this idea as opposed to trying to narrow its focus. Anyone who is a stranger is someone who should be welcomed. And the Sefer Hachinu recognizes this as a kind of development that begins with the condition and the situation of the Israelites in Egypt, for you were Gerim in Egypt, but extends to his own time to the Jewish community, which is dispersed in a diaspora, where in most places, Jews are more likely to be strangers, and therefore they have an obligation always to be sensitive to and to consider the stranger. So too, another important 13th century figure from Egypt itself, Rabbi Avraham Ben Harabam, that's the son of Maimonides, comments in his reference to Exodus 23 9 that the meaning of the ger is not what some have taken it to mean too narrowly, someone who is converted into Judaism, but rather the stranger who comes from a foreign land. All strangers are intended by that term. Again, his instruction is that we think in the most universal of ways. To go back for a moment, to conclude, to go back for a moment to Rashi, who talked about remembering that we are all imperfect. And we think back to the commandment in Exodus about honoring the stranger, about welcoming the stranger, about even loving the stranger, because you were strangers. It's all about remembering. Zahor. And if you think about the formation of Judaism as having a starting point with the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and that moment at Sinai and the covenant that is laid out in detail there, the very first commandment, I am the Lord your God, the Lord who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Where's the commandment? It's there. It's just not stated. It's a whore. Remember, don't forget, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it's based on that that you should not forget that you should remember all these other commandments that are just laid out. And the Jewish tradition, of course, overall in the Torah, there are 613 of them. So the idea of zahor, of memory, that's used by Rashi, pushes back to the first commandment, to the Israelites coming out of Egypt at Sinai. And of course, pushes forward to the 20th century, the word that is used again and again by Jews in the aftermath of the Holocaust is Zahor. Remember, don't forget those who perished, don't forget what happened. And the implications, therefore, carry from multiple pasts 
to present, and to future. Wherever Jews are hosts, we must be hospitable. We must welcome. We must love the stranger. And that's a tradition that will be variously discussed in all three Abrahamic traditions. So with that said, I would like to invite to the microphone our second speaker. Just want to put this here so I want to get our schedule. And the microphone is yours, sir. And a reminder, after he and Zeki both speak, then we will have time for Q&A, okay? okay. Apparently you do that. Wonderful. Let me thank the conference organizers one more time. I'm delighted to be on this interfaith panel. I'm kind of a veteran of interfaith panels. I always enjoy the sharing on any ethical issue. And the only trepidation I have is it's only it's a little bit difficult to speak for 2.5 billion Christians around the world, the best, especially when about half of them are not members of my own ecclesial community, Roman Catholicism. So I'm I guess I'm speaking for. Eastern Orthodox Christians, mainline Protestants, evangelicals, uh, but I'll focus on what we have in common regarding hospitality, which is quite a bit. In my comments, I have two parts. The first 12 minutes or so, I'll be looking at some theological and scriptural foundations, building on some of the same verses that Ori just did, uh, for hospitality. And in my final part two is about eight minutes long, I'll talk about how we can apply these principles regarding hospitality and virtue to the current te contemporary refugee and migrant crisis in the world. So it's exactly 20 minutes, especially if like my fast talking native New York ways kick in, which I'm feeling them doing right now. And uh, if I go over, it'll only be by a minute or two. So uh, please don't get a cane and we'll pull you off the stage. I think I'll be fine. right at 20 minutes. So here we go. At the ethical core of Christianity is a recognized obligation to benevolence and compassion. The person, the person whom all Christians recognize as savior, teacher, and moral exemplar is, of course, Jesus Christ, who calls his disciples to a way of ethical goodness, despite our own simple tendency. One of the distinguishing marks of this goodness is hospitality. Throughout his own earthly lifetime, Jesus urged us to take care of all of our neighbors, especially those in need. In such powerful parables as the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, and the Final Judgment, Jesus enjoins his followers to practice a generous love for all, including strangers and aliens, whose needs impose a true obligation upon us all. Jesus shows us the way to be practitioners of hospitality. Anyone taking the landscape of Christianity's endorsement of hospitality will soon stumble upon an apparent paradox. On one hand, hospitality appears to be a noble option that each of us may choose to exercise at our own discretion. You cannot force someone to be gracious and to be a generous host after all. In its essence, hospitality emerges as a voluntary response to the needs of some concrete person that we encounter upon whom we ought to bestow, to bestow compassion and mercy. But on the other hand, Christians reflect more deeply on the moral duties, the systemic ethical obligations that we are called to. The practice of hospitality takes on the cast of a solemn moral requirement. There's nothing optional or discretionary about fulfilling our obligation to practice this absolute duty of social justice. While some people may excel in the heroic virtue, think of Dorothy Day and her amazing colleagues and successors in the Catholic Worker Movement, which operates um, amazing houses of hospitality for the unsheltered, the hungry. It seems that no one can claim the name Christian while shirking entirely the practice of social responsibility that includes care for those in dire need. I'm breaking no new ground here in Christian ethical theory. I'm merely applying the age-old observation that Christian social ethics moves along two tracks. We recognize duties of charity and duties of justice. These are two orientations. Both involve acts of a goodwill. Each proceeds with a distinctive style. Two questions. Is your act of assisting the homeless or the traveler or the migrant a benevolent response, best characterized as compassionate, or altruistic, near to meeting the immediate needs 
of someone in distress. This is the charity orientation, which Roman Catholics associate with the corporal works of mercy, actions bringing from the heart. Question two, or does your response arise rather from hard-headed calculations geared to long-term solutions, systemic changes that will address social problems at their causal roots, such as advocating for public policies that prevent poverty, disadvantage, and social location in the first place? This justice orientation has the advantage of addressing inequities upstream, so to speak, so that the needs of the homeless or the refugee or the seeker of political asylum will be anticipated before social problems blossom and find their way to your doorstep. To cut to the ethical chase, Christian theologians, such as the authors of those official documents of Catholic social teaching, have long adopted a both and or charity and justice orientation, which looks to both short-term needs and long-term social planning. At its best, the dual approach sidesteps the moral perils associated with both extremes, neither applying mere band-aids when radical social surgery is required, nor heartless preoccupation with political policies and theoretical abstractions when people are literally dying on the streets for lack of compassionate hospitality at the local level. Proponents of both Christian charity and social justice orientations are comfortable speaking of a virtue of hospitality. So I will adopt that convention and problems of virtue. Hospitality is a virtue endorsed in the scriptures that Christians recognize as normative for the faith life of our communities. More on that biblical basis in a moment. And of course, sincere Christians are never satisfied until that inward virtue issues forth in outward practical measures to assist those in need. Eliciting commendable interior attitudes, like hospitality, is the stuff of theological treatises or uh, exhortative sermons that Christians might hear on any given Sunday. Putting those commendable attitudes and motivations into practice is the stuff of parish outreach, community service, such as when volunteers run a St. Vincent de Paul Community Center out of the church basement, or when congregants support the Catholic charities agencies of their diocese, or throughout the methodical advocacy efforts of parachurch organizations, such as Network, or Bread for the World, or Catholic Relief Services, or the Jesuit Refugee Service. It takes a large village indeed to tackle deep social inequities and religious communities of all stripes respond in myriad inspiring ways, ways that make a positive difference in the social landscape. The end point of the most overthinking Christian responses to human need is, of course, always more than just charity, charity and charitable giving to keep people alive and to keep them breathing. Once we complete the frontline efforts to secure the physical safety and the basic well-being of our brothers and sisters indeed, we naturally seek to make these gains sustainable and replicable for the long term. The model is never merely warehousing people, but rather empowering members of under-resourced communities. A handout is necessary and useful at times, but a hand up is far superior. Our commitment to the well-being of all includes the desire to see all people thrive and flourish, to develop their full potential, to build their skills, that they can truly be protagonists in human society, to be agents of their own history. Hospitality thus opens up into integral human development and even liberation that overcomes all forces of oppression. It is in the scriptures that we discover the normative basis for these obligations as, a, as Christian communities recognize them. Although the Bible is more interested in relating the narratives of salvation history than in providing abstractions or conceptual constructs relating to the virtues or the practice of hospitality. Rather, in the Hebrew Bible, I'm thinking of the Torah, but the entire Tanakh, and in the Christian scriptures, known widely as the New Testament, we find vivid accounts of hosts taking in travelers and feeding people when they are hungry, as well as repeated injunctions to ensure that sojourners and newcomers get what they need to survive and to feel welcome in the land. A hospitable person, 
starting with Abraham and Sarah in that Genesis chapter 18 story we just heard about from morning, and extending to communities addressed by the Apostle Paul in the first century. Is praised for striving to create conditions that allow everybody to benefit from experiencing an inviting atmosphere. The Hebrew scriptures contain especially rich resources establishing moral obligation to practice hospitality and compassion to the visitor and the stranger. Yeah. In the Torah and beyond, we encounter numerous stories of exemplary displays of hospitality, and we hear such ad admonitions that care for the stranger. Uh, for example, this one from Deuteronomy 10 that Orvis just quoted. The Lord executes justice for the orphan and the widow and befriends the alien, feeding and clothing him. So you too must befriend the alien, for you were once aliens yourself in the land of Egypt. And of course, the instructions on hospitality that appear in the much shorter texts of the Christian scriptures contain strong echoes of these divine commands of the Torah and the Tanakh with similar normative effect. The New Testament depicts many vivid incidents where people give and receive a warm reception. But on a dozen occasions in its 27 books, it uses the abstract noun for hospitality, philozenia in Koine Greek, literally love of the stranger. Most of these 12 occurrences consist of moral exhortations to practice this virtue by extending generosity to others, though occasionally also to be a gracious, gracious recipient of hospitality. Notably, Jesus urges his disciples whom he sends out on missions to be gracious recipients of hospitality in Luke 10, 7 and in Matthew 10, 10. Also typical is Romans 12, 13, where Paul includes hospitality in his list of Christian duties and among the varieties of works of mercy and fraternal charities, he says, be generous in offering hospitality. Paul also adds the adjective hospitable to his list of qualities of a worthy presbyter at the beginning of his letter to Titus. And the first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verse 9, is beautifully vivid in describing meritorious behavior. Quote, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay, unquote. Christians who are mindful of this rich heritage of scriptural text and subsequent theological reflection over two millennia will absolutely prioritize not only the ethical stance of benevolence, but also the virtue of hospitality specifically. To know the stories and theologies that support treating all of our neighbors with compassion and love is to recognize hospitality as a key virtue and an exemplary practice, indeed, an entire way of life, one that is fundamental to Christian identity. In extending warm hospitality to others and in graciously receiving the care of others, we sense and discern the presence of God in ordinary human interchanges. Indeed, the sharing of food and communal space among hosts and guests characterizes Christian celebrations of the Eucharist or Holy Communion, and it prefigures the heavenly banquet at the end of time. Now, the contrast between the practice of Christian hospitality and what happens in the so-called hospitality industry, which is part of the lucrative global tourist trade, is worth, is worth some note. The Christian understanding of the practice of generous welcoming is not based on one's ability to pay lodging or food. No credit cards are necessary for the recipient of the Christian virtue of hospitality, which is never a profit-seeking trans transaction, but rather part of a deeper relationship when grounded in altruism and the kind of self-giving love that Jesus preached. In its fullness, it references our communal covenant with God, not our bank accounts. True Christian hospitality is definitely not about gaining rewards, such as monetary compensation or status advantages, but about seeking out opportunities to give, not to get or receive. Ultimately, what is at stake in the practice of hospitality is a prefiguring of the kingdom of God, an opportunity to experience more profoundly the presence of God in the world, as is hinted at in the account of Abraham and Sarah hosting those three unexpected and mysterious heavenly guests in Genesis 18, well explicated by Ori. 
fascinating verse of the New Testament reflects back on this episode, distilling the lessons in this moral exhortation. So in the Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, we hear these, this sentence. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So here's part two of the talk. We do perfect, right on time. The contemporary refugee crisis related to a larger global surge in migration is surely the most urgent social issue upon which Christian reflection on hospitality may shed some helpful light. I have neither the ex expertise nor the time today to propose detailed policy solutions to this kind of complex matrix of problems, but I would like to point to some theological resources and insights that might motivate people of faith to apply the virtue of hospitality here in constructive ways, and perhaps to commit themselves to a productive agenda that will benefit the tens of millions of increasingly desperate people on the move for whatever reasons. Since we have already been mining the narratives of Holy Scripture for insights into hospitality, here is one more episode to consider. Although it only appears once in the Gospels, in chapter two of Matthew, the account of the struggle of the Holy Family, that is Jesus and his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, in their time of exile in Egypt is an important story for Christians in their appreciation of hospitality. The new parents fled clandestinely to Egypt to escape the murderous jealousy of King Herod, Herod, who was hunting down potential rivals, including the couple's newborn son. Of course, this is an episode that thematically recapitulates the earlier captivity of the people of Egypt, of Israel in Egypt, as well as in its subsequent and recurring diaspora status. Yet, based on this story, Jesus was an endangered emigre, a temporary refugee early in his life. This renders the Holy Family as an archetype of all displaced people, and it naturally generates empathy among Christians for others who suffer the perils and uncertainties of all people on the move. Surely, Mary, Joseph and Jesus owe their very lives to hospitable people in and near Egypt as they made their way to that unfamiliar land. How could any followers of Jesus, even at a distance of 2,000 years now, in good conscience, turn their backs on migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in their own moment of profound precarity? Sadly, self-proclaimed Christian nationalists fail to connect the dots here, as do so many others who support highly restrictive policies to exclude migrants and refugees from any hope of finding a safe haven on our shores. A worse distortion of the Christian message of inclusion and universal labor love is hard for me to imagine. The Gospels also portray Jesus as the recipient of the gracious hospitality during the years of his itinerant public ministry, when, the frequent, when he frequented homes of many who hosted him. Like a well-known character from the world of classic American cinema, he always depended upon the kindness of strangers. You get the reference, Blanche Dubois. On several occasions, including Luke 10 and John 11, Jesus appears to have relied on the repeated kindness of a particular household in Bethany, inhabited by three siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, whom Jesus would miraculously resuscitate from the dead. We don't witness Jesus actually practicing hospitality by opening his own home to others. That's a pretty hard task for an, an itinerant preacher. But he nevertheless practices a kind of prodigious hospitality in welcoming, at least in a metaphorical sense, the sick, notorious sinners, tax collectors, children, lepers, and others ostracized from the community, offering them his gracious presence, his healing powers, and easy acceptance as any generous host would. A parable that Jesus relates in chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke contains instructions regarding how to be a generous host to all, including those currently excluded. The clear lesson is to avoid being the kind of host who is revealed in the end as a status-seeking social climber, intent on parlaying his hosting duties into further social advantages. 
There's no room in true hospitality for selfish calculations or instrumental purposes, which is antithetical to the virtue itself. Narratives like these, where Jesus gave and received hospitality, have a long shape of Christian imaginations, leading many to resolve to practice hospitality in their own personal lives on the small scale of face-to-face -face encounters with those in need, perhaps by opening their homes to travelers. To this dynamic, we may attribute the fine tradition of hospitality practiced in the monasteries of Benedictine communities, subscribing as they do to the motto, Hospice Fainted, Christmas Fainted, translated as Christ is present in every guest. The further challenge, of course, is the social dimension, and probably what the organizers of this conference had in mind in selecting the event subtype, contemporary implications. We need to follow through in discerning the best ways to live out this virtue on a macro scale, that of a pluralistic civic community, even one as large as a nation of 300 plus million people, with tens of millions of refugees and asylum seekers clamoring for the relative safety to be found within these borders. These applicants for refugee status arrive for a myriad of reasons, fleeing from wars and political oppression and the effects of climate change. The flow of refugees from Ukraine is the latest and most dramatic crisis we face today, but sadly, it is just one of many faces of the crisis. Again, acutely aware of the stupendous complexity of immigration policy, I have no specific policy proposals to offer today. The constraints are myriad, and even the, with even the best of intentions, the devil is in the details. Even Pope Francis, who over the past decade has emerged as the world's greatest advocate for extending hospitality to refugees, even he recognizes that serious limitations facing destination nations as they seek to be of assistance to the tens of millions of souls in this current tide of refugees. No nation can take in all Congress and its borders. We all realize that. But I would venture the judgment that the sincere Christian on a quest to become more Christ-like and committed to the well-being of all his neighbors will do, will do better than what we routinely witness coming from American Christianity and its leadership in recent decades. Many questions arise. To what extent are Christians in our country willing to make some sacrifices, whether measured in volunteer hours, charitable, to charitable donations, even tax dollars, to practice the virtue of hospitality on a large scale? Will this religious community and others support the generous investment in resettlement initiatives required to enact gospel values and to overcome exclusion? Final question, will the tug of conscience and the knowledge of our religious tradition support a commitment to greater generosity as true hosts? Final paragraph now. Opening our homes and providing, providing hospitality has never been easy. So much can go wrong along the way, from burnt roasts the clogged toilets just as the guests were arriving, to the outright dangers that possibility that our trust may be betrayed. But Christianity has never been about commanding control of, of situations, but rather about going beyond our fears to show love to our neighbors, even those about whom we might at first harbor a bit of suspicion. It is certainly incumbent upon people of faith to reject those tragically prevalent toxic attitudes of antisemitism, Islamophobia, and all varieties of xenophobia, which is the direct opposite of hospitality. For all these reasons, in our age of anxiety and distrust, hospitality turns out to be a virtue that is perfectly countercultural, is it not? Even subversive at times. It is also a requirement of ethical consistency for all Christians, for whom it is a revered virtue, a great grace, and a sure blessing for all time. Thank you very much. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is this the way we will always hold this? Is this a way to put it someplace? Do I sit there? Whichever you want. Come. 
I think I will change the style so that would be okay. I think. This one. So I'm looking at that watch uh, clock over there. Make sure that I will not pass 20 minutes. Hopefully, uh, if it becomes too much, you can just uh, wave uh, to me, uh, give me a sign. So good afternoon, good evening, good, e good morning. I think still it's morning. Um, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, especially Rachel, uh, who has dedicated herself to this event, and Ori and Annie. Uh, thank you so much for organ organizing this. Um, it is a great honor to be at Fordham again. I was here, I think, two years ago, maybe. So my topic is um, an Islamic approach to the concept of strangers, uh, the concept of uh, uh, needy people. It is a long topic. Um, it's a long uh, concept. I will try to put in, um, in, in a very brief way, uh, basically, because I think you can write a book on this just from an Islamic perspective. Uh, Ori mentioned uh, Abraham uh, in the Islamic teaching, also it's very important. Uh, Abraham it, it himself, the story of Abraham itself has a big uh, implication in the Quran. Uh, uh, Muslims believe uh, in Abraham and in Ishmael and Isaac. They believe that three of them were prophets of God. They were messengers of God. And they are prominent, of course, messengers of God. It's very high level uh, in the realm of humanity. And uh, the son that was uh, to be sacrificed, generally in Islamic understanding, it says it was Ishmael. But I found in one commentary of the Quran saying that it was Isaac. So it, the, the Quran does not specify. It says his son. So his son, uh, it, it goes to the closest name that was mentioned earlier, and that was Ishmael, and I think that's why Muslims have said it was Ishmael. Anyway, Abraham submitted himself to the will of God, but our topic will not be Abraham per se. I will talk about some other examples from the Quran. When discussing the idea of welcoming strangers in Islam, it is important to begin with the Quranic verse Worship God and associate nothing with Him. And to parents, do good. And to relatives, orphans, the needy, the neighbor who is close and the neighbor who is far, a stranger and a kin, the companion at your side, the traveler, and those who your right hands possess. Indeed, God does not like those who are proud and boastful. The term that is used here for traveler is Ibn Asabi, and literally means the son of the way. I mean, in Arabic, the son of the way means the one who is on his way or on her way traveling. Contemporary uh, come, sorry, commentators of the Quran, Mufassirun, Described this term in several ways. In his commentary of the Quran, chapter 9, verse 60, where the term also appears, the term Ibn Sabil, the son of the way, appears. Ibn Kathir discusses Ibn al Sabil, describing them as travelers passing a city who have nothing which helps them to continue on continuing their journey, even if they have property in their hometown. So spend something on them, even if they are rich in their hometown, because they are needy, they are in, in need of your help in this situation. So help them. Another commentator describes it saying, the stranger who is not in his hometown being in need or not in need. 
God commands one to be kind and do what's beautiful to those strangers because they are in a situation of strangeness and need. And they cannot find the things that they had in their home countries. And therefore, charity should be given to them so that their broken heart would be mended. Given its prominence in this verse, it is clear that care for the stranger is an important element of Islamic faith. As a matter of fact, as we know that one of the pillars of Islam is charity, to give charity, to give zakat. 2.5% of one's wealth should be given to the needy. It's a requirement, an Islamic requirement, one of the pillars of Islam. If you are wealthy enough, you have to give. Not if you wish, you have to. And one of the portions of this charity is given to the Iblis to those who are traveling and in need. Another word in the Islamic tradition for strangers is gharib. Ghuraba is the plural. The Prophet of Islam praised the strangers. He personally took care of them when they arrived in his city. Several narrators recorded versions of the same story of the Prophet speaking of the Ghuraba, the strangers. In one version, the prophet said, blessed are the strangers. The companions of the prophet asked, who are the strangers? And the prophet of Islam responded, the strangers are the people who are stripped from their family and relatives. They are away. So they are blessed. Another statement of the prophet. Another hadith expands on this idea and further explains why strangers are blessed in Islam. So one of the narrators reported that the prophet said, Islam began as, as, as something strange and it will return to being strange. So blessed are the strangers. In his book on the concept of fitan, uh, trials, tribulations, turmoil. Noaim bin Hamad, is very famous uh, early Muslim scholars, records an interesting statement that one of the companions of the Prophet narrated from the Prophet on the theological meaning of Uraba. The Prophet said, of the people, the most beloved to God are the strangers. The Prophet then was asked, who are the strangers? He responded, those who escape oppression. It doesn't say they were Muslims, non-Muslims, those who escape oppression. Today, we have many people who are escaping oppression, who are escaping bombs, and they are asking for help. So the prophet encouraged people, encourages people to help them, and he said they are blessed. They will be rewarded in the sight of God. Those who escape oppression because of their religion and get together around Jesus, the son of man. Interestingly, Jesus is symbolizing here that he will be supporting the strangers. Jesus will be supporting the strangers. From theological context, it is clear that the prophet is describing a time of turmoil during which people will be forced to migrate due to oppression and leave their towns and property. The exact timing of this is only known to God, but it is near the end of the time. There will be some kind of turmoil and those who are supporting strangers will be blessed. So anytime if there are strangers and people are supporting them, they are blessed. In my book, Islam's Jesus, the only kind of mention uh, that book, I prefer to interpret such hadith allegorically, you know, when uh, we'll be coming around Jesus, they will turn around Jesus, people will be coming uh, taking a future around Jesus, that should be understood allegorically, not physically. 
I said, don't expect Jesus coming from sky. He will never come. Yeah, there are, there are some narrations, but that is allegorical. I said it should be understood allegorically. So the meaning of this, I said in that book, uh, allegorically, and not to understand literally, to mean that dialogue between dialogue between Christians, Muslims, and Jews can bring a time of peace where strangers are welcome and oppression ends and the flow of refugees will be prevented. Muslims, Jews, and Christians, if they come together, they can make a big change in the world. And a rough calculation, I made, they constitute more than half of humanity, about 58% of the world population are Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Abrahamic family. If they can, can come together, they can make a big change and bring peace, contribute to peace. We should briefly mention that in Islamic ethics, the guest is known as the guest of God. Guests are strangers, generally. They are travelers. Some would say that this is because, religiously speaking, guests brings blessings with them. Additionally, there is a famous hadith that says, those who believe in God and the day of judgment, hadith, the, the saying of the prophet is a term used in the Islamic tradition for the sayings of the prophet. So prophet of Islam, prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him says, those who believe in God and the day of judgment, let them honor their guests. In other words, if you believe in God and the day of judgment, you must honor your guests. This is therefore a central principle, not just of Islamic theology, but of Islamic ethical tradition as well. A central yeah. principle that you honor your guest. As a matter of fact, when we mentioned Abraham, I was looking at my solar phone, trying to find that verse about Abraham, and said when he, when he guests came, he just prepared a roasted calf for them. So he was so generous. He was so kind to his, uh, to his guests. And it turned out that he realized his guests were not approaching the food and he was becoming afraid. These are strange people. And then they said, we are angels. We are messengers of God. We don't eat. Angels don't eat. They don't need to eat. So let's now turn to some examples of welcoming the stranger in the Islamic tradition. The Islamic tradition has a well-developed literature on the proper care and welcoming of strangers. There are many examples from the Quran, the Hadith, saying of the Prophet and later Islamic history. I will not be able to mention them all. It's important to start with the Prophet of Islam's treatment of strangers and the destitute. From at least the beginning of this prophet, his prophethood, the beginning of his prophethood, it's clearly shown that most of the people who accepted his message were strangers, al -Ghuraba. in Mecca. Apparently, the elite group from Mecca were not happy with the prophet's fondness for and care of those social outcasts, many of whom were from the lowest ranks of society in Mecca. And they were generally the slaves and servants those who first accepted his message, were strangers. The Meccan elite told him that they would accept him if he repelled those strangers. Were very high people, I mean high rank people in the society. They said, Muhammad, if you repel these people, these strangers from around yourself, we will come to you, but we cannot do it there. A Quranic verse came and rejected their request. The verse says, do not repel those who call upon their Lord in the morning and in the evening, seeking his countenance. You are not accountable for them and they are not accountable to you. If you do repel them, then you will be of the wrong course. 
Quran asks the Prophet not to accept their request and do not repel those dangers. One of the commentators of the Quran records that this verse about strangers among the companions of the prophets was revealed when Abu Jahl, a stern opponent of the prophet said, look at those who are following Muhammad. They are our slaves and some Bedouins and humiliated people. If he accepted only the elite and the leaders of the tribes, we would have followed him. And they asked, according to the commentator, they asked the prophet's uncle, this elite group asked the prophet's uncle Abu Talib to tell him this and to repel them. And he told the prophet what they had said. And then the Quranic verse came and the prophet rejected their request. The prophet's care for the poor and strangers continued after his community's migration to Medina. As we know, he faced very hardship in his own society. They did not accept him. Eventually, he was forced to migrate. He had two options, either to fight against this uh, elite group of Meccan, uh, Meccan idol worshippers, or to migrate. So he preferred migration. In Medina, there was a place adjacent to the mosque. He built, actually, a place adjacent to his mosque that was available for strangers, the poor and destitute. This was famously known as the Sufa. The Sufa literally means the lodge or the place which is adjacent to the main building, like a separate uh, location adjacent to the main building. It is believed that the number of people who took shelter there totalized more than 400. Some people would say that they didn't have any place to go. And the prophet would bring these people food and would cook for them. He would cook for them. We have narrations that the prophet himself cooked for them. In addition, some of the prophet's companions who were financially stable would bring them to their homes to feed them. The prophet sometimes would say, these, these, these people from the sofa are in need of food. Who can take care of them to, tonight? And one of the companions said, I will do that. And they will go and be his guest for that night. The Quran also replete with examples of proper care for strangers and travelers. The two most famous of these are the stories of the prophets Joseph and Moses. Actually, the prophet, uh, the story of uh, prophet Abraham is very largely mentioned in the Quran. The story of Lot that uh, Ori, uh, my colleague Ori, all mentioned, it's also considerably uh, detailed in the Quran. But I will just focus on two of them, and that is Joseph and Moses because these both are very, uh, very, very much detailed in the Quran. The two most famous of these are the stories of Prophet Joseph and Moses. Uh, Joseph is the son of Jacob. In Islam, he is also known as the prophet. He is not a regular person. He is the prophet of God. The first danger is Joseph. And his story is found in chapter 12 of the Quran. Joseph's story in the Quran is similar to what is found in the Bible. God made the prophet Joseph a stranger. And then as a minister in Egypt who took care of the stranger. He was a stranger and he became a person who was taking care of strangers. Perhaps the most well-known of this story uh, uh, of Moses' migration from Egypt to Midian as a result of the oppression of Pharaoh. These outlines of this story are well-known from Exodus and the story in the Quran is generally comparable. Not exact, but very much similar. This story is found mostly in chapter 28 of the Quran. 
The chapter begins by describing Perot and his associates as criminals for dividing people. We recite, the verse goes on, we recite to you from the news of Moses and Pharaoh in truth for a people who believe. Indeed, Pharaoh exalted himself in the land and made its people into factions, oppressing a sector among them, slaughtering their newborn sons and keeping their females alive. Indeed, he was of the criminals. And we wanted to confer favor upon those who were oppressed in the land and make them leaders and make them inheritors and establish them in the land and show Pharaoh and Haman, Pharaoh's helper, Haman, and their soldiers through them that which they had feared. The chapter then gives, gives us description of Moses' mother and how Moses came to live in the court of Pharaoh. The Quran does not give details regarding his life at the court of Pharaoh, but skips the moment when Moses to the moment when Moses due to striking down one of Pharaoh's men who was arguing with a member of the children of Israel is forced to flee for his safety. So Moses saw two men were farming and one of them was the members of Pharaoh's associates and the other one was from the children of Israel and the, uh, the, the one person was from the Pharaoh's associate was overcoming and Moses strike, was striking him. So with that one strike, he, he died. Moses did not mean to kill him, but somehow he died. So Moses escaped because he realized that he will be killed by Pharaoh's people and he left. The Quran does not give details regarding this life at the court of Pharaoh. The Quran recounts prayer that Moses gave when he feared that he would be captured as he fled. Lord, protect me from the wrongdoing people, from the Pharaoh and his associates. This is the prayer of Moses. Uh, Muslims would pray, would have this in their prayer, in their daily prayers. Uh, Lord, protect me from the wrongdoing people. In this, in chapter uh, 28, verse 70 to 20. Literally, this is a verse 21. And tells how he hopes for God's guidance. Perhaps my Lord will show me the right path. Now a refugee, he finds himself in the town of Midian. Where he met, where he meets two girls and helps them to water their sheep. Moses meets with two girls, and he realized that they are a little bit uh, backing. They are not uh, involved with the with the group with the crowd. And he approached them, and they said, "We are waiting until these people are leaving, and then we will water our sheep." And then Moses said, "I will help you." Uh, and B, he, he realized that they were the daughters of Jethro in the Islamic teaching is known as Shu'ayb. He's also a prophet in Islam. So this is followed by another prayer of Moses, my Lord. He says Moses uh, has this prayer. My Lord, truly I am in need, <coughs> excuse me, in need of whatever good that you send down to me. Moses is taken to see Jethro, the father of these shepherdess, shepherdesses, who says, who say to Moses, fear not. Uh, uh, Shu'ayim says to Moses, fear not. You have escaped from the wrongdoing people. You have escaped from the people of Pharaoh. You are now in a safe place. Here in the Quran, we have Moses as a refugee, exemplifying the actions 
a refugee should take to pray for God's assistance and to be of service to those a refugee meets along his way. It also talks about the response of the host to take in the refugee, to take in the refugee and give him or her shelter. Moses also, so in this case, is Jethro. He's taking Moses, Moses in to his house and give him food. And then actually Moses will marry his daughter even. There is a beautiful story uh, uh, in the Quran. Moses, uh, Jethro says, well, can you serve me a little bit with this farm? And Moses says, for how many years? And he says, eight years. If you could do it 10, that would be wonderful. And Moses accepts that he will work for him for this amount of years. But they were like very much becoming close. Uh, refugee and the one who is taking care of refugee. Okay. Um, here in the Quran, we have Moses as a refugee, exemplifying the actions of a refugee should take to pray for God's assistance. It also talks about the response of the host to take in the refugee and give him or, or her shelter. Moses also exemplifies the conditions of being a refugee and an immigrant muhajir. Muhajir is another term. Now we mentioned Ibn Sabil, the son of the way, Huraba, the stranger, and Muhajir, the immigrant. These are all Islamic terms for those who are in need. It comes from the word Hajara, which has been translated as both migration and emigration. In its verb form and as an active participle, the root Hajara from which Hijra is derived is mentioned several times in the Quran. This is certainly in keeping with the idea found in Exodus. Chapter 22, verse 21, and that is, do not mistreat or oppress a stranger, for you were strangers in Asia. Exactly in the Quranic language, it says, those who migrated, God will reward them. Those who migrated out, you know, escaping oppression, they will be rewarded. And if there is oppression, they are allowed to migrate. The land of God is best, the Quran said. Might be to a place that there is no oppression. Some place you'll find somehow. An essential element of Islamic faith is to protection of the life of innocent individuals. From a theological perspective, these include strangers, migrants, and refugees, all of whom are considered innocent and hence must be protected. A further religious duty of those who are financially able to do so is to give shelter to those in need. Refugees in turn are bound by certain rules and laws. Interestingly, Islamic uh, law has developed some rules about this. Classical Islamic jurists elaborated on some of these cases. For instance, Al Sarasi, a famous Hanafi scholar uh, of Islamic uh, juris, uh, jurisprudence, he says, if a Muslim enters a foreign abode, having been given asylum and found a treasure, if they found this in the house of some of the people, they will return it to them. The person is taking care of refugee. Now you are in their house. And you found a treasure in that land. He said, you have to give that treasure to the owner of the house. It's not yours. Yes, you are a refugee then. You found it, but it is not your land. It gives to the owner of the house. That is also a trust. You show them that you are trustworthy. And as a real, religiously, you are not allowed to own it. What is in the house belongs to the owner of the house. By accepting the asylum contract, they have guaranteed that they will not betray the trust. Therefore, they are obliged to fulfill what they promised. This is not legal explanations. 
We have mentioned some examples from the life of the Prophet and the Quran, but the Muslim community has also been strangers for much of its history. This begins with migration with a small group of Prophet's followers to Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia, early Muslims migrated of oppression. And their kind treatment by the Christian king that, you know, of that land. This story is important in Islamic history and it tells us much about Islam and the proper treatment of strangers. Umu Salana, who later married the prophet, she narrates the experience of those who left Mecca out of oppression for Ethiopia after describing how the prophet had asked them to flee, to flee Mecca for Ethiopia and how they found kindness there. She talks about how the Quraysh, the ruling class of Mecca, sent a delegation of two people and a variety of gifts to that king so that they will bring them back. She details their experience at the court of the Abyssinian, the Ethiopian king, Nigus. So she says, after visiting the patriarchs and eventually after meeting with the king, the delegation of the Quraysh said to the king, and a very interesting story and very well known in the Islamic tradition because this is the first migration of Muslims before even, <coughs> excuse me, before even, uh, uh, before even um, uh, migration to Medina. So I will conclude soon. O King, some young people left our city. Uh, o King, some young people left our city. They have you know, innovated a new religion. It's different from your religion and the religion of our grandfathers. And we know nothing about this new religion. So return them back to us. They have divided our people, they say. They came to you so that you would protect them, return them to us so that we can return them to their relatives and their tribes. And their intention actually to talk to them. The religious advisors of the king said, uh, like the, the uh, bishops of the king, they said, they speak the truth, O king, return them because these two know these two know their people better than us. The king became angry and he said, I will never do this to a, a certain group of people who take refuge in my land. So the king brought all members of the group together and invited his advisors and bishops and the Meccan delegation as well. Then he asked these. Who is those who escaped the persecution in Mecca, tell me about the religion by which you left your people. And the cousin of the prophet, Jafar bin Abi Talib, speaks on behalf of the group. He mentions the essence of this religion. And he says, we believe in the same God as you believe. And that's why our prophet sent us to you. After he listening to them, and then uh, Jafar recites chapter 19 of the Quran for him, and part of chapter 19, which is named after Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. And the king turned to the delegation of Mecca and he says, Not for a mountain of gold, I will return them to you. I will not return them to you. And he protected these refugees. So he became an example of protection of the refugees. And I think this is the last paragraph. Theologically speaking, Islam is described as the great, the greatest humanity by some Islamic scholars. If it's humane, it's Islamic. If it's greatly humane, it is more Islam. That's what's understood in the Islamic teaching. While medieval Islamic scholars of jurisprudence developed a body of legal theory about migration and its relationship to Islam, the legal pronouncements of medieval scholars are no longer able to adequately address the refugee crisis 
of our time because it was in the medieval, medieval ages. Now we have new conditions. Today, scholars of jurisprudence must reassess the legal pronouncements of the past guided by essential principles of Islamic law and the Quran, essentials of the principle of the Quran to derive at new approaches to meet the challenges of our changing world. There is not sufficient time today to discuss such legal theorizing, but perhaps the theological underpinning I have described here can be the basis for such a legal study. What I hope that the foregoing has made clear is that the basic principles of an Islamic legal theory regarding the rights and responsibilities of refugees and those who are strangers should be found in the protection of those in need and love and mercy towards those on earth. And I will fi finish with this prophetic statement that remind us, and the prophet says, those who are merciful, the most merciful will show mercy to them. Those who are merciful, the most merciful, which is Allah, which is God, will show mercy to them. Be merciful to those on earth, the one in heaven will be merciful to you. Be merciful to those on earth, and the one in heaven will be merciful to you. Thank you very much. I think we have about 20 minutes for questions, both from here and um, are you monitoring the, the on, online chat so we don't see? Okay, good, good, this room. Uh, okay. Should I up here, should I go there? Or do you monitor, or, or, or should I? I can do it. Okay. 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 Well, let's start here. Are there, are there any questions from the field that is present? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just wondering what institutions are doing to uh, implement these novel ideas on uh, your respective faith backgrounds and on what you spoke about, particularly in a New York context. And because we're at Fordham, for example, how does Fordham instill, if you have any idea of it, what, uh, how does Fordham instill these values right. in the faith engagement? How do other Right. Um, churches and temples and right. organizations here. We, we, we will hear about that in part this afternoon, but unless you have anything particular to say about I Fordham. I just affirm how good a question that is, because yes. it's always problematic to ext extrapolate, is that the right word? Uh, on a large scale, writ large, something that moral advice that's really primarily geared on a small scale for individuals to practice hospitality? How do big social institutions practice hospitality? How do nation states of hundreds of millions of people practice hospitality? No, no pretense of an answer, excellent question. <laughs> but, we, but we will have two different speakers this afternoon who address two different entities that are that answer that question for you as entities. Okay. I think in the, in the Muslim tradition, there are many organizations who are helping the refugees, helping the uh, I know, for example, in my city, in Cleveland, there are many uh, organizations who are uh, very well developed. Uh, they are, um, for example, they brought a good number of uh, uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, some Muslims help, uh, some other people from different traditions help, especially Ukrainian community help. So there are organizations. There is one organization called Embracing Me. Uh, I think they are helping people in a variety of places, uh, especially refugees and refugees from different countries. So uh, there are many of them. Uh, and and uh, as my colleagues mentioned, I think this afternoon there will be more elaboration on that. Right. Yes. Um, Hold on one sec. She wants to bring you the mic so they can hear you. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, picking up on that, what kind of pressure are your uh, religions placing on political um, members of our 
Congress. Uh, they need to have, uh, it needs to be a national attitude toward uh, safety for the refugees. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's happening yet. Well, so I'd like to know if we're all doing about that. The uh, Roman Catholic community has the advantage, I think it's an advantage, of having very obvious leaders, moral, uh, recognized moral leaders, the bishops. There's 200 bishops in the United States or so. They're meeting right now in Baltimore, at November annual meeting. Some of them have been excellent. So along the border in Texas, lots of those bishops have been good. There have also been some that have not been, in my opinion, so uh, welcoming or, or advocating such a welcoming policy at the border. So it's a mix, even within my own community, I can speak of a mix. You're always looking for voices of moral leadership and of course, finding some better than others. Is, is Joe Biden particularly affected by the bishops because he's Catholic or does he so completely separate church from state in his own yeah. mind? Joe, Joe Biden, uh, over his agenda overlaps the US Catholic bishops agenda often. We all know it's not a complete overlap on sensitive issues like abortion. On, on migration, yes, there's quite a bit of overlap between his migration policy, what he'd like to see, unable to push it through Congress so far, and what the bishops have stated as a collective group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's some pressure. Um, I think uh, the Jewish community has become particularly conscious, I would say, in the last several years of the precipitous rise in anti-Semitism. And that both affects its attitude toward incoming refugees from places where anti-Semitism is prominent, but also the problem of anti-Semitism in the United States as a preoccupation that distracts from this issue, if that makes sense to you. But we also will hear about that this afternoon a little bit more, because we, uh, we will have a political voice joining us. Other questions. Other questions. Were there questions in the in the Q and A on the on the on the screen? My back is to the screen, so I can't. We're testing your reading abilities. <laughs> so one person actually asked a couple questions. Go for it. They start off with, "Who is the stranger?" That yeah. is, who gets the I guess entitled to hospitality? Uh, not according to Abrahamic texts discussed by the three speakers, but normatively, that is according to contemporary practices of practitioners of the Abrahamic religions. Is a stranger understood as a universal definition, but all humans, regardless of not religion, sex, race, geography, criminal status? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a first grab at that for a particular reason, because I think uh, it can, in contemporary terminology, refer to anybody and everybody in any and all of those categories. One of the issues that I have found disturbing going back, I guess, about five years is our transition from using the word refugee to using the word migrant, because as uh, I forget which of you guys made that comment, but a migrant is in traditional basic common parlance England, English thought of as someone who comes temporarily perhaps to work and then go back home. A refugee is someone who's fleeing for various reasons who can't necessarily go back. And our inclinations to uh, help a refugee may not resonate if we think that individual is not a refugee, but a migrant. And I do believe, and this is in part your questions also, that there was a rather concerted, politically informed choice Barely to use the word, and I'm going all the way back to ISIS and all the refugees from Syria before we even got to Ukraine, to use the word migrant rather than refugee to undercut our more inherent sympathies to the word refugee. Having said which, I'll tell you a story, which is I made that comment in a panel, and one of the panelists was a young woman, I would say 25 or so, who said from her point of view, she preferred and appreciated being called a migrant rather than a refugee because she felt for her, refugee carried a connotation she did not want attached to her, so she was more comfortable. So I get that, but I still stand by what I said. Our choice to use the word migrant rather than refugee again and again and again, I think has, a, has a, a, an intended nuance that I find unfortunate and contradicting what all of us have been talking about from out of these three traditions. 
Yeah. I'll affirm all of that as very much on target. And just to add the one thing, international legal category of refugee includes a well, possessing a well-founded fear of harm, persecution, uh, again, unable to return to your homeland. That's what establishes legal claims uh, at the border of any country. And you have to demonstrate, obviously, if you're coming to the United States, that that is your condition, that you that you in that situation. Okay. To Well, a refugee to whom we'll grant asylum. Yeah, that, those are closely related terms, but you're absolutely right. There yeah. is a difference yes. in the legal status, asylum, stricter conditions than refugee. Yeah. I think the uh, the concept that uh, in Islam is muhajir is the one who is immigrant or, or migrant um, has connotation of going to a place and staying there. Uh, even if there is intention to go back, uh, it's not a requirement to go back. We, we see this in the life of the Prophet when they migrated from um, um, Mecca to Medina. They didn't like Medina. The companions were not happy with that because they loved Mecca. And they were getting sick. They were not actually accommodating to that the environment, the environment of Medina, although about 280 miles far from from Mecca, uh, based on the condition of the time, and actually climate also a little bit different. So we have a narration that the prophet saw them and they were really very much longing for, for Mecca. Uh, and the prophet prayed for them. And he said, oh Allah, oh, Allah, oh, oh my God, put the love of Medina in the hearts of my companions so that they will not be longing for, uh, for Mecca anymore. And they said, they said, after that, we love Medina even more than Mecca. Huh. So it is it is this connotation that you long for your for your hometown, but eventually they started loving their uh, new hometown. So in the Islamic teaching, uh, wherever you are, you are, you consider that place as the divine gift, because the moon, the sun is the same. The, the owner of the planet is one, and that is God. You are in his land, and you are with his people, with his creatures. So that is the way that Muslims will look at it. Mm. I wrote an article, if you have time, you can Google it and, and read it. I think it's available at the, uh, as an online uh, the PDF uh, on the immigration and the, the practice of the prophet of Islam and how this can be applied to our modern uh, times. Um, uh, it was published in the uh, Journal of Scriptural Reasoning. Uh, I think uh, it should be available. Just put my name and Journal of Scriptural Reasoning and Immigration. I think it should come uh, that you can enjoy reading it. This is also you know, part of this larger question of identity. And if I come from some place where I was born and grew up to a new place, even though the circumstances of my leaving were unpleasant, I had to flee. There's a certain longing I may, this is not true for everyone, I may very much have for the place I left behind in which my language, my customs, my culture, my traditions were all embedded. And now I've got to adjust to new language, new customs, new culture, new traditions, which might, might not be easy. Uh, obviously, the degree to which I feel the one or the other may be in part affected by the circumstances of my having had to leave the other place. But it is it is part of the, the complexity of what we are, I guess, as a species. And then kind of the other half of this uh, question says, are strangers potential or strangers or potential guests limited to a narrowly defined co-religionist slash sectarians? Um, and not to not including those of other religions such sex. Um, in the context of stranger hospitality, for example, how are we to understand the treatment by um, parody slash Orthodox Israeli Jews of Palestinians in the territories? Um, two, by Christian inquisition of non Christians, and three, by certain Islamic groups of other Islamic groups. Are these in keeping with the teachings of the Abrahamic religions? 
My answer is simple, no. <laughs> <laughs> but just as, as you were saying, not all the bishops agree with what you believe is a proper Christian policy. So that's going to be true across the faiths. Again, we're human. And uh, there are plenty of us who think one way when others of us think another way. And in this context, that will apply to the cases this individual gave and to plenty of other cases as well. I'll just use the word universality and I'll point so the universal concern, no one's excluded from our social concern. One thing I'm proud about the Catholic Church, our agencies, Catholic charities, um, Catholic hospitals, even Catholic cemeteries, certainly universities like Fordham, Georgetown, and John Carroll, our doors are open to people of all faiths. You can go to a Catholic hospital no matter what your faith. You can receive assistance from Catholic charities or our resettlement efforts for refugees no matter what your faith. Yes, I think uh, if, if we follow the Islamic teaching, uh, uh, we should not distinguish uh, between people based on their religious background or ethnic background, because all people are human beings and they are creatures of God, regardless of their religious background, ethnic background. Uh, there is a saying of the prophet of Islam uh, says, with neighbors, uh, regard, with regard to neighbors, if your stomach is full, and your neighbor is hungry and you are able to sleep. If your neighbor is hungry and you are full and still you are able to sleep, you are not of my community. So powerful. And it doesn't say your neighbor is a Muslim or Christian or a Jewish or a Buddhist, whatever uh, tradition is. It's a, your neighbor. Your neighbor is a human being. So very powerful message. And we have some narratives that the prophet would ask. He had a, a Jewish neighbor and he would say, ask his wife, have you shared our food with our Jewish neighbor? Just an you know, example. Uh, so there are a variety of uh, examples in the life of the prophet. Uh, as uh, as uh, Ori mentioned, unfortunately, some Muslims don't follow us. That is true. That's another situation. But the, essence of the message is that actually to not be uh, uh, discriminative, uh, to be inclusive, to, to include all. That's it for the questions. Okay, any more questions from out here? You all have apropos who has food and who doesn't. You have lean and hungry looks. I guess we're, we are breaking for lunch at this point then. Is that correct, Rachel? And then all right. Thank you all very much for this morning. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you around one o'clock. Thank you.